a shout out to viewer Ezekiel Machkowski, who wanted to learn more about the election of 1876. Why is that election so interesting? Because both sides tried to manipulate the will of the people in order to get their man into office. And if that sounds familiar, wait until you hear the details. I'm Bob Summers, and this is a presidential story. The 2020 presidential election was the 59th election in U.S. history, and perhaps one of the most contentious. In addition to that one, there were four others that were also very controversial. 1800, 1824, 1876, and 2000. The 1876 election was particularly controversial because of how close it was, the level of post-election maneuvering, and how it was eventually resolved. At the time, everyone expected Republican Ulysses S. Grant to run for an unprecedented third term. Although it was not law until the ratification of the 22nd Amendment in 1951, Grant decided against a third term after the House overwhelmingly passed by a vote of 233 to 18, a non-binding resolution declaring that the two-term tradition was to prevent a dictatorship. Without Grant in the race, the Republicans selected Ohio Governor Rutherford B. Hayes as their candidate. The Democrats selected Samuel J. Tilden, Governor of New York, and the prosecutor who sent legendary political boss William Boss Tweed to jail. On Tuesday, November 7, 1876, in the only presidential election between two sitting governors, 82% of the registered voters in the country went to their polling place and cast a ballot for either Hayes or Tilden. Although there were exceptions. Let's start in Colorado, because even though there was no controversy, there is an interesting side note. Colorado was admitted to the Union as the 38th state on August 1, 1876, three months before the election. Without the time or money to run an election, the Colorado legislature selected their three electoral college electors, which was how electors were selected before the popular vote became common. This was the last election in which any state chose electors through the legislature, rather than by popular vote. In other states, there were widespread allegations of election fraud, election violence, and other disenfranchisement, primarily of Republican black voters. The most extreme case was in South Carolina, where an impossible 101% of all eligible voters in the state had their votes counted, and an estimated 150 black Republicans were murdered. After the first count of votes, Tilden had 184 electoral votes to Hayes's 165. 185 were needed to win. Tilden was one vote short. 19 electoral votes from Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina were in dispute, and there was one more electoral vote in Oregon that was also challenged. In Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina, both parties claimed victory. The Republicans in those states controlled the returning boards, the people who would determine the official vote count. Both Republicans and Democrats rushed into these three states to watch and try to influence the counting of the votes. The returning boards determined which votes to count and which votes to throw out, if they deemed them fraudulent. One of the points of contention revolved around the design of the ballots. At the time, parties would print ballots, or tickets, to enable voters to support them in the open ballots. To aid illiterate voters, the parties would print symbols on the tickets. And in this election, many Democratic ballots were printed with the Republican symbol of Abraham Lincoln on them. The returning boards in all three states argued that fraud, intimidation, and violence in certain districts invalidated votes, and they threw out enough Democratic votes for Hayes to win. All three returning boards awarded their state's electoral votes to Hayes. But the Democrats had a plan. They would name their own electors and submit them. The Republican governor of Florida signed the official certificate for the state's four electoral votes. The Democratic certificate was signed by the state's attorney general and the Democratic governor-elect. In Louisiana, the official certificate for the state's eight electoral votes was also signed by the Republican governor. The Democratic gubernatorial candidate also signed a certificate. The certificate from South Carolina was not signed at all. According to the Tilden electors, 
the certificate for their seven electoral votes was automatically tied to the popular vote, which they claimed they had won, but which were rejected by the Republican-controlled state election board. Remember that one extra elector in Oregon? Well, the results in Oregon overwhelmingly favored Hayes, but the Democratic governor, Lafayette Grover, claimed that one of the Republican electors, John Watts, was ineligible under Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2 of the U.S. Constitution. Watts was the postmaster of Lafayette, Oregon. The clause in the Constitution states that a person holding an office of trust or profit under the United States cannot be an elector. So Governor Grover replaced Watts with a Democratic elector, since he had had the next highest vote total, even though Watts had resigned his postmaster position before the Electoral College met. So again, there was a duplicate vote. With all these conflicting electors, there was quite a mess when it came time to count the votes. The Constitution states that the President of the Senate shall, in presence of the Senate and House of Representatives, open all the electoral certificates, and the votes shall then be counted. The President of the Senate is usually the Vice President, but Grant's Vice President, Henry Wilson, had died the previous year, leaving the position vacant. So the temporary President of the Senate was Republican Thomas W. Ferry. The Republicans held that the power to count the votes lay with the President pro tempore of the Senate, Ferry, with the House and Senate being mere spectators. The Democrats objected to that construction, since Ferry could then count the votes of the disputed states for Hayes. The Democrats insisted that Congress should continue the practice followed since 1865. No vote objected to should be counted unless both houses of Congress agreed. Since the House had a solid Democratic majority, rejecting the vote of one state would mean neither candidate would have a majority. The election would then go to the Democratic-led House of Representatives, who would elect Tilden. With an unprecedented constitutional crisis looming, Congress, somehow, agreed to pass a law on January 29, 1877, 34 days before the inauguration, to form a 15-member electoral commission to settle the dispute. Ten of the 15 members came from Congress, with five from each chamber. The majority would select three and the minority two. Since the Republicans controlled the Senate and the Democrats controlled the House, the first ten spots were evenly split, 5-5. The last five spots were made up of Supreme Court justices, two Republicans and two Democrats. The fifth would be chosen by the other four. The 15th member was critical. They selected the Independent Justice David Davis. It is said, no one, perhaps not even Davis himself, knew which presidential candidate he preferred. Just as the Electoral Commission bill was passing Congress, the Illinois legislature elected Davis to their open Senate seat, and the Democrats in the legislature believed that they had purchased David's support by voting for him. Oh boy, had they miscalculated, as Davis promptly excused himself from the commission and resigned as a justice to take his Senate seat. Since all of the remaining available justices were Republicans, they selected Justice Joseph P. Bradley, who they considered the most impartial remaining member of the court. That selection proved decisive. Bradley joined the other seven Republicans in a series of eight to seven votes that awarded all 20 disputed electoral votes to Hayes, which gave Hayes a 185 to 184 electoral college victory, the closest in U.S. history. Congressional Democrats did not like the results from the Electoral Commission, so they filibustered the results to prevent Hayes' inauguration. Anticipating violence, President Grant quietly strengthened the military force around Washington, D.C. Samuel J. Randall, the Democratic Speaker of the House, realizing that creating chaos would backfire on the Democrats, finally ruled the filibusterers out of order and forced the completion of the count two days before the inauguration. In order to move forward, House Democrats and Republicans agree to what has become known as the Compromise of 1877. There are no known documents, or even a precise understanding of the terms of this agreement, but the main effect was that Democrats would accept that Hayes won the election in exchange for the removal of federal troops from South Carolina and Louisiana, the last states to be occupied after the end of the Civil War. 
Hayes insisted that Democrats in those states pledge to uphold the civil and voting rights of black and white Republicans. Once the Democrats agreed, Hayes pulled those remaining federal troops out of the South, effectively ending Reconstruction. White Southerners quickly turned their backs on their promises, systematically disenfranchising black voters through poll taxes, literacy tests, and intimidation. Democrats in the South created a segregated society that used terror and violence to oppress African Americans. Black Republican voters felt betrayed as they became more and more disenfranchised in Southern states. Democrats dominated national and local elections for decades afterward. Since Inauguration Day, March 4th, was a Sunday, Hayes was sworn in during a private ceremony the day before, Saturday, March 3rd, with a public inauguration ceremony on Monday the 5th. Hayes was inaugurated without incident. Upon his defeat, Tilden said, I can retire to public life with the consciousness that I shall receive from posterity the credit of having been elected to the highest position in the gift of the people, without any of the cares and responsibilities of the office. Ten years later, in order to avoid a repeat of the 1876 election, Congress would eventually enact the Electoral Count Act of 1887 to provide more detailed rules for the counting of electoral votes, especially in cases of multiple slates of electors, being received from a single state. The concern was that without a formally established counting procedure in place, partisans in Congress might use the counting process to force a desired result. The Act set out procedures and deadlines for the states to follow in resolving disputes, certifying results, and sending the results to Congress. If a state followed these standards and the state's governor properly submitted one set of electoral votes, the Act stated that this final determination shall govern. Also in the Act, the creation or use of any false writing or document in the Electoral College process is a felony, punishable by five years imprisonment. The Act thus regulated Congress to resolve only a narrow class of disputes, such as if a governor had certified two different slates of electors, or if a state failed to certify its results under the Act's provisions. Thanks for watching. If this video sounded eerily similar to current events, please help out the channel. Like and subscribe. And please visit POTUS.com to learn more interesting facts about the presidents.